as was mentioned, I'm Dustin Burke, a senior partner at Boston Consulting Group. I'm based here in Chicago, so I didn't have to travel far for a change. Um, and very happy to be with this group. I lead our supply chain team globally, and I lead a squad called Supply Chain AI, which is a team of uh, digital supply chain experts, operations veterans, data scientists, engineers, and designers that build digital supply chain solutions for clients. I touch a few different industries, but I spend a lot of my time on consumer products, so we'll touch on a few examples from that industry that illustrate what we're seeing in supply chain today. So just actually to take that CPG example I promised you, what we saw last year is that consumers bought fewer units of stuff from our largest CPG players. Despite that, companies were able to see rising sales. That was an improved mix, price increases that many were able to pass through. And those rising sales have allowed us to borrow some time to deal with the uncomfortable reality of slow growth. But what I'm about to talk to you today about is I think that borrowed time is pretty much spent. So while sales did grow at a pretty nice clip in this industry, I think some of you who are in other spaces, industrials, healthcare, the hardware parts of tech, probably recognize a similar pattern, operating costs actually increased further. So margins for many companies began to compress. Now we might see this as the inevitable return to normal after COVID disruption and rapid inflation. And that could be okay if our key stakeholders saw and expected the same thing. But they don't. So when we look at investor expectations, again, I'm going to stick with consumer products as a place that I know, but I'm confident that we have seen the same in some other pockets of the industries. We actually see that investors expect margins to recover, but then continue to increase for the next couple of years, next couple of quarters at least. This is what your CEOs are seeing. They know this, or they should know this. And this is pressure on them. And when there's pressure on them, I guarantee there is or there soon will be pressure on you, supply chain leaders. So the other thing I think is important to emphasize is that supply chain issues kind of aren't over. So in 2021, some producers of TED came to me and they said, we want a supply chain talk. And of course, my immediate response was, nobody really wants a supply chain talk. They insisted that actually people did, and so, and so we did that. And then in 2022, um, Jack White made us all pretty rock and roll. He named his <laughs> tour the Supply Chain Issues Tour. Uh, but in 2023, it's not gone. We actually look at what the C-suite comments on and earnings calls quarter to quarter. And if you look at the topics that come up and the phrases that they use, supply chain, whether you're talking about cost or resilience, and I think it's impossible to disentangle them, is still in the top three. We've been displaced by ChatGPT. Uh, that'll be there a while, not forever, I think. Um, also, supply chain is at the center of issues like recession, inflation, talent shortages. These are all also supply chain issues. So um, good news and bad news, the spotlight is not off of all of us, but that can be an opportunity also to get what you need and ask for investments and capabilities. I think it's important to pause and not just ping pong back and forth between the competing priorities that seem to fluctuate quarter to quarter based on what the C-suite does say on earnings calls. We know we have cost pressure. We know we can't give up on resilience. We have done some research at BCG to look at what separates the companies that break out from the pack over time, not just specific to operations, from their competitors. So which ones outgrow the competition? Which ones have higher profitability, maintain share leadership, deliver great shareholder returns? And there are sort of six broad patterns that we see. And the leading companies employ most of these six. They have alignment around a powerful purpose. They know who they are, what they are for. They communicate that to their customers and to their employees. That, in turn, does help to support a differentiated people advantage. People want to work there. They want to stay there. They get developed. They have a career path. They have an 
operating model, a way of working together in teams that does break down silos and responds to changing priorities. And they have an innovation-driven culture where they give people time and funds to invest in building something new, not only responding to yesterday's issues but anticipating tomorrow's. Increasingly, they invest in a tech infrastructure that is modern. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are all on one instance of SAP. That means they can bring in data to an environment where they can do different things with it from different sources. And more recently, they have begun to embed AI into how they work, whether it's in customer-facing applications, whether it's in making their work more efficient. So we know this is hard. We face trade-offs all the time, and this is not new. Most of us grew up in supply chain dealing with these trade-offs. We have to bring it back to what we can do now and how we respond to the pressures. So let's take a couple of examples. Let's say we decide to outsource aggressively. Hey, we can get access to other capacity. Maybe we can use that to grow. We'll have multiple partners. Maybe those are 3PLs or co-manufacturers. And we can use that to respond to shocks to our supply chain or to uncertain demand. If we do that, we might underutilize our own assets. We may pay higher costs, so it could actually make us less profitable. Okay, what if we buffer? Let's build up some inventory. This sounds pretty familiar, I think. <laughs> we can definitely drive higher service levels. Again, maybe we'll insulate ourselves from some shocks. That inventory has a cost. If you have to store it, if you don't sell it, you'll write it off. The holding costs are more painful than they were a couple of years ago, where interest rates are. Maybe we should shrink the network. Maybe if we become a little bit smaller, we'll be nimbler and we can respond. We'll be lower cost. We'll have higher levels of utilization. I mean, maybe we have to shed some product lines, some brands, and some businesses to get there. But that might be contrary to our growth goals. So we think the old moves to the age-old problems aren't the right ones. The problems are old, but we need to reimagine the responses. And the companies that do that successfully are the ones who are going to win. So let's talk about some potentially different responses. Again, these all present trade-offs. but. For many of us, they may be more attractive trade-offs. Rather than investing in inventory and having that tie up capital, we could invest in the business that we need tomorrow. That might be a different mix. That might be some new countries that we enter. And for many of us, nearly all of us, that could be a lower carbon way of doing business. There is a cost to that. But doing it gradually and over time is less costly than doing it suddenly and too late. Rather than merely shrinking networks, we can think about making them more flexible. Maybe we don't need to run several different lines that are built for long campaigns. They have long changeover times. They run at a fast rate, and they're for high volume SKUs. Maybe we need a couple of those, but we need some innovation lines that are easier to, to change over, run at a lower rate. They can make smaller volume SKUs. Same in distribution networks. Maybe we don't need to shrink to just a couple of big ones. We need a combination of automated ones and manual ones, bigger ones and smaller ones that are closer to the customer. And it is not time to stop digitization. We have to sustain the digitization investments, but drive ROI with a laser focus. Let's talk quickly through a few examples of places where you could do this, how you could make it work. Cost. We all grew up, if we grew up in operations and supply chain, focused on cost. For some companies, there was an unhealthy reduction in focus on cost for a few years. But that is definitely back. But what isn't healthy is just coming to operations and saying, here's what I need from procurement, from logistics, and manufacturing, and stopping there. You need to take a holistic approach to costs. There aren't growth functions and cost functions that should be pitted against each other. Instead, we need an all-in approach to reducing costs that includes how costs are built in upstream through product design, how they're impacted downstream, downstream through customer service and support, how we can all free up cash in this time, not just by reducing inventory, but also by addressing payables. Again, this needs to be a total company view. Digitization, I mentioned before, 
And I want to come back to that, because we're all here talking about digital supply chain. I was in a discussion this past spring with a COO of a large consumer products company who has an ambitious cost goal. But he did tell me, we're going to get there partly through continuing or increasing our investment on digitization and automation. Because we know it's the right long-term way to get there, and so we have to do it in the short term. We have to take out the work that doesn't need to be there, and we know two, three generations from now when they want that company to still be thriving and winning in the marketplace, there won't be more people, relatively speaking, to work in plants and distribution centers. There might be fewer, relatively speaking. We've also disentangled the companies that are actually winning by investing in multiple use cases and scaling successfully, and they do some things notably differently when it comes to digital supply chain investments. 74% of those companies that do that successfully say supply chain is one of their top three priorities for digitization. Those companies intend to spend nearly twice as much as the competition on digitizing their supply chains, and over half of those who are already leading say they're going to keep up the pace. I think there are ways to build some of this resilience that Fab talked about that aren't as costly as that inventory uh, buffering that we talked about before, or building you know, plants with excess capacity. It's capabilities. It's seeing what's coming around the corner before it hits you. It's understanding scenarios as you design your networks and your operations. So if we kind of bring it back to what we think this means for this group um, and going forward, the mission. Again, three key things we think we can do that have a better trade-off profile, sustaining digitization, but really focusing on ROI, those most important use cases, focusing on what it takes to get those things to actually work and practice and scale across your companies. Bridging to your future supply chain, which serves your future business. You probably already know what that should look like. And building flexibility in your asset base, in how you operate. All of these things are quite difficult. This is a transformation and it will have to be managed that way in order to be successful. That means having specific initiatives with milestones for completion, names on those with expectations of delivery. They aren't just goals. We can't just leave them on these slides if you want to make them a reality. Building capabilities along the way. It's not only or even primarily about building assets. It's about enabling your best people to get skills as they undertake these things on behalf of your companies and using the medium term, using the profitability we have today to put in place what we need for tomorrow in terms of those capabilities and in terms of how our businesses will need to look differently. Thank you.